I'm Sarah L from Boating New Zealand and today I'm here with Emma Outeridge who's a Kiwi woman who has brought two worlds together both volunteering in Africa and also the world of the America's Cup. She's married to Nathan Outeridge, an America's Cup skipper and Olympian but she's also been active with a charity in Uganda for many years raising sponsorships to send children to higher education. She's written this book about her experiences between two worlds and let's have a talk to her now about how those things have come together. So Emma, you were brought up around the America's Cup and your parents were involved. What makes a Kiwi girl from that kind of background get involved in Central Africa? Can you tell us about how you first went to Kaso and about your experiences there? Absolutely. I think growing up in the America's Cup world, I kind of thought as a little kid that that was what everyone did, that life was just following the sailing event around the world, which obviously you grow up and realise is not quite the case. I went away to university in Wellington and really just had a bit of an awakening there. I think, you know, being in the university scene, all of a sudden you're learning all these new things and my eyes were just really open to the fact that there was a whole wide world out there that did not revolve around the America's Cup and sailing, but also that beyond New Zealand there were a lot of people that were doing it quite tough around the world. I sort of had a really pivotal moment in my life seeing the film Hotel Rwanda, mm -hmm. which ironically I was doing a ski season in Aspen, Colorado at the time. Um, and, and really just was shocked to learn that all of these atrocities were going on during my lifetime and that I'd been sort of so unaware and that really brought Africa rocketing onto my radar. Of course Africa itself is a huge diverse continent but I just got fixated on this idea that life is an accident of birth and that I'd really done nothing to deserve this lucky accident and so I just wanted to find a way to try and give back and do something meaningful. Uh, at the time I was you know, in my early 20s and I had these huge dreams of trying to save the world but I just, to me, going to volunteer somewhere in Africa just sort of gave me a way to try and give back to this world that I felt had always treated me kindly. And so can you tell us a little bit about the CASO organisation and the children there? Absolutely, so I still to this day feel so grateful that I discovered CASO. I think of all the places I could have ended up but CASO itself is essentially a primary school. It was created in 1999 by a phenomenal Ugandan couple called Dominic and Rose. Dominic himself was a poor boy from this village of Kibera where CASO is located. Rose, his wife, was actually the daughter of a prominent magistrate from Kampala, the capital, and she fell for the boy from the wrong side of the tracks. But they were both teachers and they could just see in 1999 when they created the school HIV AIDS was just ripping through the whole area and leaving so many young children orphaned and they wanted to give those children a way to get a really decent education. Technically in Uganda there's supposed to be free education for all but the standard in the government schools is so low that you don't have much of a chance if that's where you end up. So they created the school with just 12 young children at the beginning. By the end of the first year there were 49 and it just continued to grow and grow and eventually parents from the area learnt about the school that wasn't just giving kids a free education but it was giving them a really top level education and so they wanted to send their children and were prepared to pay school fees. So that started this whole journey whereby Dominic and Rose run this amazing juggling act that there are those that can afford to pay school fees and those that can't and then a whole raft in the middle that will bring along pails of milk or a basket of potatoes from the garden to try and contribute towards their child's education which means that those students that still really can't afford it can be supported through primary school. And it's not just a primary school, There's, it's, it's really a whole community initiative. CASO itself is an acronym standing for Kibera Adult Attention and School for Orphans, which is quite a mouthful, but it just gets across this idea that they also wanted to help educate the adults of the area. Mostly, uh, a lot of them were illiterate, and they really wanted to just sort of help raise the standard in the whole area as a whole and recognise that it wasn't just the children, it was also the adults that needed some support. Right. And so first, the first time he went there was, was going to Africa a real shock, a real awakening? Absolutely. Um, through you know my childhood travelling a lot through the America's Cup, I kind of felt like I'd been to different places and experienced different things and naively thought that I was quite a, a well-travelled 25-year-old and then arrived in Uganda and was just completely blown away by just how different everything was. There was sort of no common point of reference, nothing that felt like, oh, this is a little bit like home or a little bit normal. Everything just felt so, so very different. 
So it was such an extreme culture shock, but an amazing eye-opener. And I very quickly just fell in love with the whole place because it was just a place of such warmth and such incredible laughter. So many people would say to me, oh, it must be so sad going to this primary school that's got a lot of orphans and children, you know, doing it tough. And I would just look around and all you would hear was laughter ringing through the school. And these children, even though technically they didn't have much by our standards, they didn't really know that you were meant to need all these things. And so they just felt really lucky to be at school. And so then, of course, it was quite a shock for you to go back into that Louis Vuitton Cup, America's Cup world. And, and how did you cope with that transition? <laughs> Not very well at the beginning. I, if I thought I was unprepared for the shock of arriving in Uganda, I was completely unprepared for the shock of returning to what had always felt like my normal world. I arrived in Nice on the Côte d'Azur to work on the Louis Vuitton Trophy, which was an event that had been set up in the interim between America's Cups. And I was just completely floored by how hard it was transitioning back into what had once been my normal life. And I was constantly converting the price of everything into Ugandan shillings and then working out how much maize that would translate to and then bursting into tears. And I just thought, this is impossible. It's got to be one or the other. You can't live between these two worlds. They're just too different. And I was terrified that I'd have to give up one for the other. And I didn't know what to do because I just fallen in love with Kaso and Uganda and I wanted to keep that very much a part of my life but the sailing world was so much a part of who I was as well and so I just didn't really know what to do. So how did you come to that realisation that you could actually act as a bridge between those worlds rather than having to be full-time in one or the other that you had a role to join those worlds together so they could support and help each other? It happened slowly over time and I guess it was actually my community of sailors that helped me to realise it. That once I got over that initial shock of just not being able to talk without bursting into tears all the time, once I finally was able to start telling my stories, I couldn't stop and all I wanted to do was talk about Caso. And actually I realised that the people I met in my sailing world who were so used to having this kind of itinerant, changing um, countries all the time and moving from place to place and learning to adapt in all the different worlds. I mean, you know, in the America's Cup, people are moving around, they're putting their children in school, they're setting up a new life in all these different countries and different cultures. To them, I don't think it was such a huge leap to think, okay, well, here's this friend of ours who's been in this other totally different world, but let's hear about it. And so then they wanted to, to support and to help. And I think because they knew that because the time that I had spent there and the connections that I kept with everyone in Uganda, this was a way that was legitimate, that was trustworthy, that was honest, that they could support something that they also had grown to care about. So it was really the people in my community that made me realise that I didn't have to actually give up one for the other and that the most valuable place I could be was actually right there straddling those two worlds and connecting both sides. I think the other thing I found really interesting that I never imagined was in the beginning it felt very much like it would be a one-way flow of the people in my sailing community helping these children in the school in Uganda that needed support, whether it was to fund their educations beyond primary at secondary school or whether it was for the different fundraisers I was running. But eventually over time I realised actually the flow was going both ways and people like Glenn Ashby from Team New Zealand, him and his wife Mel have been big supporters from the beginning and they were the ones that were thanking me that through their sponsorship of their girl Viola in Uganda, they were able to teach their children about the value of education and the value of these things that we often take for granted. And I think they were really grateful that I gave them a chance to be part of something meaningful. So it was really nice to realise that it wasn't just a one-way flow, it was going both ways. So it's pretty exciting now to have your book out in the world and, and was it interesting reliving those experiences while you were writing it? Did you work from diaries or how did you come to write the book? I did. Well, I, it's really been a journey writing this book over the last 12 years. I started it in the village in 2009. Once I got to Castle, I realised it was such a phenomenal story that just, I believe, had to be told of what everyone was doing there. And so I had this huge stack of diaries and I would just take them everywhere with me and just scroll down notes as to everything everyone said, all the observations around me. So most of the dialogue in the book is literally wow. notated from as it happened. So no, I'm just excited to, to be able to share this story with a wider audience and the response has been wonderful. People have been so encouraging and supportive. We had an amazing book launch the other night at the Royal New Zealand Yacht Squadron 
which was just so exciting to be able to finally stand up in front of a room full of all these people, a lot of whom were friends from the sailing world, and finally raise a glass of champagne and say, we've done it. Awesome. Oh, thank you very much for your time, Emma. It's been great talking to Emma today. And keep an eye out for Between Two Worlds. <laughs>